am delighted to be joined by Jerome, Esther, and Aldane. Um, this upcoming roundtable will focus on how to create an environment in your school that fosters diversity and enhances equity and inclusion as a whole school. We'll also discuss why diversity is so important in a school setting, the individual strategies and initiatives that each guest has implemented in their own school setting to ensure a more inclusive and diverse environment for both teachers, staff and students, and the overall benefits and impacts of having a diverse staff and student body in an international school context. So welcome, Jerome, Esther and Aldane. Thank you. Hi, Matt. Should we just start by doing a quick introduction of everyone? Um, Jerome, do you want to go? Do you want to go first? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Jerome Lingo. So I'm from the Philippines, and this is my 14th year in international school teaching. And currently, I'm working as a secondary learning support teacher in Hong Kong Academy. Brilliant stuff. Esther, what about yourself? Hi, I'm Esther um, Stami Daniels, um, raised in London, but from various backgrounds, Indonesian, Polish, um, and I'm currently working in Muscat, Oman as year two lead and DEI across the whole school. Brilliant. Aldane. Hi there, uh, my name is Aldane Winter, currently also um, London raised and in a school in London at the moment. I am an assistant head at Weatherby Senior School uh, looking at our focus on pastoral and operations. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so my first question, um, why is DEI so important in an international school setting? Who'd like to, to open with that one? Um, you want to start? Yeah. Um, go on. You go for it. Uh, okay, sorry. Jerome. I feel like it's really important because um, if you look at the common factors between the international education, they pride themselves of being in a cross-cultural, linguistically versatile, and it's a bridge between nations. But also, slowly, they're also looking at inclusion in not, not only in cultural background, but in terms of their learner profiles and that one. But there hasn't been much focus on the voices of ethnic, ethnically and culturally diverse educations. And sometimes we're slowly recognized as how over the years they're often ignored or silent. So I think this is a great opportunity because all the resources are there and present. And um, it's a really good opportunity for us to spring up some awareness and education of our DEI, um, DEI things that, uh, that is going around the world. What do you guys think? Mm, I completely agree. I, I think um, I'm an international school, but mainly it's a British international school. Um, and I think similarly, I think there's been quite um, uh, a potentially unequal representation in terms of stories told and centering of certain stories so and I think a lot of that is legacy of colonial situations or historic situations between countries and I think that's something that we do need to address it's been shied away from but I think it's an important factor when you're looking at international schools which stories do we center in those international schools and as Jerome said we're looking at um, different communities and different students bridging and you know traveling potentially across many different cultures and how are they welcomed or welcoming and how are they integrating within local culture versus a global um, international culture so it's a hugely important topic to look at in in international schools especially yeah I completely agree with both of you and just to link it together I was in a IB school previously, and there was an opportunity to look at those stories being told. And ultimately as teachers, we tell the stories that we recognize. And what I found is the more diverse the staffing body, for example, the more diverse the stories are going to be. And if we couple the diverse staffing with really good CPD around DEI, what it does is it gives us an opportunity to reflect and understand, okay, this is what's happening and these are the little things we can do as a collective that will make a big and meaningful impact. 
wonderful stuff. Anyone else want to add add on to that? Great. Um, so my next question, what does current best practice look like when it comes to DEI in, in international schools? Um, for example, policies practice, um, school culture, classroom practices. Um, what does current best practice look like to you? Uh, Esther, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think it's an actual, I think it's a very tricky one because I think it completely depends on your context. And I think, as um, was just mentioned, I think your teaching staff has a huge impact on that and where they have come from, their background, their understanding, their level of knowledge and experience around that has a huge impact on what that actually looks like in practice. And it can be very challenging to address certain issues or certain um, concepts that arise from this journey that happens, that needs to happen in the schools. Um, I think a lot of um, a lot of um, sort of difficulties or challenges around that um, are possibly that I think there are a lot of it is because of a lack of wanting to offend or a lack of awareness of certain things. So in terms of best practice, it does completely depend on who your cohort, who your cohort are, who your staffing are, and in terms of and definitely who your leadership, who your leadership is because without that understanding and the understanding of where you're trying to go as a school, your practice will need to adapt to those different situations. So best practice is, is a challenging one to say what exactly it looks like. It does look like incorporating um, training around what, what, is the, what are potential issues in your school, potential biases that you may have within your school, um, and looking at how you can remove barriers, increase voices, decentering or centering certain stories that may not have been been told before and really reflecting on your own practice both individually as an educator but also collectively as a staff body and student body so it, it does depend on your context completely I agree with that what really resonates with what Esther said is that that emphasis that all stakeholders when we're doing DEI within our school community, that all stakeholders actually has ensuring that they all, all voices were heard. This is not only focused on students, faculties, and parents, but the staffs, staffs as well that are actually working with us, whether they're directly or indirectly hired by the school. One of the things that has been really good with my former school in AISJ in American International School of Johannesburg and is they hosted listening sessions for all groups within the school community and that alone is a big huge step we're in like oh we have opportunities to be heard which doesn't doesn't come often right and um as you said there are we we are we are learn i don't know about you guys but i'm also learning a lot with my community and i take pride in that that we're learning together but it's so it's so um it's so empowering to hear that there are positions just like what Esther is doing, the DEI, DEI consultant in schools wherein she could look at what where does it where does this fit in the curriculum? I think that's one of the things that we really value now that that it shows it gives us a sign that hey the the schools around the world are listening to us. There are also several. Um, experts now that are doing such things like Darnell Fine, Joel Laban from AIE, LOC. And, you know, it's so empowering to hear that some schools like International School of Dakar, because they've been doing this, they've completely revamped their board policies and revised hiring priority, resulting to 40% of all of their new hires being people of colors and making sure that diversity above IB experience, teaching experience is the new norm for, uh, for appointing. Lastly, I feel like what's current best practice is that student voice and student centers and taking it into a new level. There are some high school social justice councils sp springing up and these are all student um, organized, which looking at how to serve, uh, how to focus, recenter the service learning opportunities and community par partnership wherein they are empowered and speak out and actually helping them even more uh, to continue the DEI process in the school. Yeah, to be fair, I completely agree with that. And the idea of student agency to push 
the the focus on diversity is a great one and um, what i also find in that is one in making sure you've got a lead person and that it's not just a random additional title that they actually have the time the resources and the money that's required to encourage student leadership to want to whether it's raise awareness around particular months or international days they need to be able to have access to speakers if they want the more expertise um, and also being able to have the time to figure out CPDs for themselves and how they're going to get the cultural shift that's needed in an international school to get, get this understanding of, okay, this is important to us and it's just as important as our teaching for learning. It's just as important as the student's experience because ultimately it's, it's going to be a part of what they experience, what they see around them, what they hear is based on us as adults and the environment that we build around them. I think that physical space and who's occupying it and what we do to make it more internationally minded and more tolerant and more, like, I think that's all really important. And I think one of the best practices I saw was in my last school as well, where we embedded diversity CPD throughout the entire year. So every term there was a CPD that was focused on diversity, at least one. And that encourages discussions, it encourages conversations, and it's all, it, you can't forget it because you know there's something that you're going to do about it. Whether it's, you know, you're reading a book, if you're doing a book club that's centered around DEI, or you have to read to watch a short video, or you're, you know that you're gonna do this anti, this bias training, all of these things knowing it's coming I think you're like constantly thinking about it the same that same way we think about our subjects as well I think yeah I think that's a really good point I think um having that embedded within your within your SDP having something where you revisit that regularly like you said and it's forward planned and that you've got all the stakeholders like you said on board that you're touching base with and yeah I think you've mentioned having a lead and having someone who is held accountable for that so that their role is to make sure that these things happen and that they're the, the person who people can touch base with mm. is really important for that to actually happen within within the school. I think people have a lot of good intentions. This has to be at the forefront because essentially this is well-being, not like you said, not just for the for the students, but for the staff, for the stakeholders. This is ensuring the safety and the, the flourishing of your whole community to feel like they belong within your environment. I think that's a really great formula, student student agency and having a specific person, having an expert on that one. And, and looking at it, like for example, uh, I've experienced this also while recruiting, Com coming from an outside perspective, if you're looking at a school and then you have certain organizations that are already built in the school and you have a specific person that is facilitating these conversation and these initiatives, it's, it's sending signals throughout the community outside or even outside of the community that, you know, this is really important for our school. And this is something that we really put our mind and heart into. And for me, as, as, a, uh, as a possible employer, uh, um, uh, as a possible employee and that one, that actually drives me towards that. You know what? I feel safe here. And this is a good space for me to grow because... I will be accepted here. And I think that goes to parents who are looking for schools also and also for other staff so, uh, who are trying to find a ways to connect or build partnership or even work in the school in a non-teaching setting. Excellent stuff. Um, and sort of moving on to, um, you know, students and, and DEI, how, how can we encourage students to tackle uncomfortable DEI topics in international school settings? I can open with this one. What yep. I think, and please tell me if I'm wrong, I find that the students that I've dealt with seem to have the vocabulary that you want your staff to. They are on social media. They they understand the evolving nature of social justice. Um, if you just take, for example, the LGBT community and the a lot of the media attention that's been on, even like 
trans people, the students, I think they just get it. They understand the terminology. They understand what it means to be included in that community without being told in a workshop. Um, they might need to understand what the school's position is on it in terms of like, how do we support them? But I find that they understand the terminology. And with those people at the forefront of your student councils, if they are the people that are set, uh, setting up your diversity committees and your LGBT safe groups and your other affinity groups you might want, I think they, with that lead person who is also confident and capable and willing to drive the narrative forward, I think you've got a formula for success. You're, I think you're so right. I think um, my colleague was actually telling me today that he, he teaches a year five class and the children were like, sir, you need to talk to us about this. You need to tell us because we're going to go out into the world and we need to have discussions. We need to know about this information. So I think we, I actually had another co a conversation where colleagues are like, oh, we don't know if we want to talk about these things because potentially we're raising issues with children where they may not have issues or see issues. But actually the children, like you said, are fully aware of of all the the different um, you know different things that are going out in the world, like you said, social media. Um, so yes, they need to have opportunities to talk about things when they rise, if they rise, or before they rise, even to give them the vocabulary, the confidence, like you said, to tackle things, the bravery to be able to say and speak up and say, actually, I don't agree with that, and creating that environment where they feel safe enough to do that and confident enough to take that out into the wider community if they need to as well. Yeah, I, I, I really like the what we said about creating a safe space. I think that's integral uh, in making sure that to encourage our students to tackle un uncomfortable DEIJ topics. Um, on a personal level, I feel like having opportunities to tell your story. That's why I'm very grateful with International School Network, which was able to publish an article about um, how some of the hardships that I had when I was uh, when I was starting in, uh, and recruiting international school education and be given that platform by ISN, TIE online. That actually was a catalyst for students to to talk about it. Like when 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 it got published and it was acknowledged by the school and of course it 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 actually it was actually passed on through our community through several social media social media sites it it opened up some conversation like oh i didn't know that was your story or i had no clue how how difficult it is so to be to be in an international setting as a as a person of color so there's there's no substitute with any standardized DEI training than the real empathy that we see from real stories from people that we know. So um, for educators out there, and if you have a story to tell, whether it's whether it's about writing an article, this one, um, um, joining a podcast. Tell your stories because the easiest way to for a person to connect, uh, especially our students, to connect with someone else from another walk of life is for them to hear about our experiences, our hardships. And also, it's so nice to celebrate the successes with them. Conversations and stories humanize us. And when we can empathize with someone's situation, we're able to connect on a much deeper level. And that takes away some of the uncomfortability that the DEIJ topics present because there's a text to self-connection that is presented to our students. Excellent stuff. Um, <clears throat> And moving on to some of the key strategies each of you have um, initiated that have worked in your schools, um, can each of you talk about some sort of actionable and practical tips that that you have all used in, in your own school settings um, to sort of amplify DEI uh, um, in your environments? I feel like we could always... Yeah. I feel like we could always start by explicitly teaching them. Um, we could not assume that they know some of the vocabularies. Of, um, and this one, 
in in order for us when we're starting something new it's very important in any organization to build common meaning and common commitment that's why i like what aldane said like we should tackle these terms what's really microaggression talk to it during advisory or or be open to those things and give like real life examples or welcome some stories where in this space are being tackled uh, once you build the common meaning and com commitment as a school everything else follows for me uh, and i'm also speaking in experience on this one yeah, yeah uh, all right we are sorry go ahead sure no no you go sorry i was going to say agree and like absolutely the education and the 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 support around the language and the the kind of um, structures that are in place to explain to people what, what that is, to explain to your staff and your students. Um, we took a really layered approach to it. So we have had that where, we, where we've drip, drip fed um, information um, like you advised through regular staff meetings where we've touched base, um, really recognizing that lots of people, particularly our staff are at very different places on this journey. And it is a very, it's a challenging journey at times because it does require a bit of self-reflection. It does require sometimes relearning things that you thought you knew, but actually when you're lo looking at them from a different perspective, or like you said, someone else's experience, realizing that actually the different stories and different perspectives can shake your understanding of how you think the world works or things work and actually realizing that perhaps you know then there's 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 a there's a something that you have to kind of relearn or re-evaluate re yourself so that was that was quite a challenge but important that that was done and allowing again those spaces to talk and allowing for staff in our community to raise questions and feel safe to raise those awkward questions like is it okay to use this word or i've used this word and i'm not sure if that's appropriate or not and not feeling that, and this ended up filtering down to our students, that restorative approach in terms of, you know, you're not racist, you're not wrong, or you're not, you know, you're not, um, you know, misogynistic or anything. You, you need to talk about what, you know, what it is that you're using, why you think this or why you feel this way, or why you think it's okay to use this word, you know, for the children, for example, and the impact that that has and really unpicking it. But that is a huge journey and but in order for it to be meaningful you do need to peel back those layers and really unpick you know why we're doing this work what we want the impact to be and ultimately the benefit for all students so i think there's been a you know a look at well we only need to look at the ethnic students or you know the brown students black and brown students because those are the children that need representation or actually in an in an international setting and in a you know in, in any kind of setting um, all students need to be made aware of all of these stories. Like he said, they benefit from hearing these stories, these narratives, learning to empathize with people that are not, you know, that just look like them, people all over the world, because ultimately that's what we want. We want people to understand different people and understand that we have similarities and differences, but that we can, you know, understand where people are coming from and not treat people differently or disrespectfully because of that story. So there was a lot to do with that, but the knowledge and understanding and recognizing those layers and peeling them back, but ultimately giving all of us an opportunity to share and discuss that. No, I, I completely agree with that as well. And I think the stories of those individual students and staff is so important that if you're a new school quite early on in the DEI process, it comes across as being quite overwhelming. And what I found helped in my last school is we, as a school, we know we're doing, you know, the basics, you know, you might have, you should have your Black History Month, your LGBT Month, International Women's Day, Day for Disability. You've got all of these pockets around your calendar. And what I found that really helped is that we themed the year. And so we are going to always do these key moments in our calendar, but this year we're going to focus on uh, racial equality and our CPDs, our workshops with the students, that's going to have this lens of racial equality. And that really allowed us to focus in on the terminology in September because we did a book review and it was a case of, okay, we're at the beginning. You might be a bit further ahead, but right now we're trying to get onto the same page with our terminology. And then in the next term, around Christmas time, we were looking at certain film choices where we were able to think about what we had discussed in September and 
thought, okay, these words I wasn't really sure about, but I've now seen a film that kind of complements the book. And this is my second conversation. I feel a bit more confident. And then by the summer term, when we're looking at different medias like podcasts and articles, I found that the staff were incredibly confident because they knew there was a safe space for them to be able to get things wrong and learn from that before they had to deal with the students. Because I think we feared judgment from our peers um, and having the, the theme really allowed us to tunnel in on okay, racial equality for one year. And we didn't just finish on racial equality and when it came, we just moved into a new theme and had that background theme kind of sprinkled in workshops for the next academic year. So we have a layered approach like you mentioned as well, but just allowing for that constant opportunity for reflection on the same theme. So my language is evolving and my willingness to speak to my, my peers and my friends increased over that academic year. So sort of drip feeding. Yeah. Or exactly. Constant drip of, um, yeah, of touch points. Wonderful stuff. All right. Um, and how, how can schools be more proactive when it comes to DEI within, within their school setting and embed it within the curriculum? Uh, um, sort of moving from a reactive to a more proactive approach. How could we go about this? Any thoughts? Well, I'll uh, jump in just because I finished. Um, I think I said it already, time, resource and money are instrumental. The idea that you can do this one by yourself and two with nothing but just enthusiasm is I think a little bit misguided. Um, it requires such a huge cultural shift that you need to have support from the senior team. Um, I found it to be an advantage to be on the senior team as I was leading because I was able to ensure that every inset had um, an element of diversity if I wanted it to be. We started the year and ended the year every inset with diversity. Um, and which meant that I could also meet the heads of, you know, the, your English, drama, individuals and societies, you know, your histories, to make sure, us, okay, let's do an order of our curriculum. Did that in September, and then I'm going to come back again in October after the break, see what's changed. And I'm going to give you two years to show me how you've diversified your curriculum and how you're accounting for all of the different voices and perspectives that we see in front of us when we look out to the 20 kids we've got in our classroom. And I think it links onto the point you mentioned, Esther, about accountability. I'm accountable for making sure something happens as a lead, and you're accountable as a subject lead to ensure that you are doing what we've discussed, but you understand the why. It's not a forced task. It's a, I'm doing this because you, Jennifer in my classroom has been taught history and doesn't, hasn't seen a role model yet. And I think that type of encouragement through the CPD allows for meaningful change that is, you don't have to drag them through it. They, they want to do it. They will come to you with ideas. It's what I found. But that was an IB setting. I'm in a national curriculum school and I'll report back in a year how the national curriculum side of things changes from the IB. Um, in regards to reactive to proactive approach, just to give a little bit of context on this one, I feel like there has been a huge emphasis on DEI, um, practically because when the Black Lives Matter happened, it snowballed and then it blew up in our faces because some of the alumni of these international schools resorted to change.org, Instagram stories, and all the social media platforms that they have in order to in order to you know um not actually to criticize but the overlying statement on those um petitions and instagram stories are actually they care about the school and they they, they are craving for change and i think it was the last it was sad to see because i think it was the last resort because there weren't enough opportunities for them to be heard. 
And that's one of the last resort wherein they took it upon social media. And that's why somehow some international schools have a reactive approach. And coming from those experiences, we want to ensure that students are being heard. And there are listening sessions, there are informal surveys, there are things that we check up on the students on how they feel about the community that they interact with and how do, how's, how, how's the culture going. There should be a temperature check on those ones so that we're taking that proactive approach. I think one of the things I, I love what Esther said at the beginning is that it's a lot of people don't really didn't dive deep the, uh, on these D, DEI topics soon enough because it was it was uncomfortable. And we need to learn how to lean into discomfort because brave conversations aren't brave if there isn't some discomfort. We've learned that the hard way. And by embracing that, we learn to be proactive. We need to lean into it and challenge yourself and the group to contribute, even if they had time to fully formulate their ideas. Um, and also, it's it's especially in international schools, it's it's uncomfortable because that means we need to recognize our privileges. The people that we cater, the population that we cater in international schools, they know for themselves that they, they have so much privilege in their hands. And the, soon, the sooner that they recognize these privileges that a specific group of them enjoy based on their financial and economic status or their race or their gender or sexual orientation, would provide specific ad advantages for them to be more proactive and not shy away from these topics. So I feel like from experience again, I'm, that these are the things that would help them to have a uh, proactive approach in the school community. Oh, yeah, I agree. I think ultimately it has been reactionary. <laughs> the whole movement has been reactionary, but we can flip that around and look at what we can do to be proactive moving forward. Um, and as we've mentioned already, just listening to your stakeholders, listening to what those needs are, um, thinking about, again, who you're centering, who are you centering in your curriculum, who are you centering in your school? There's been a lot of talk around belonging and building a culture of belonging and inclusion, but asking yourself belonging to what and including to what and who are you including and why? Um, so I think that, that sends a message out in everything that you do, like you said. Um, and like we said, really, everything that you do from who you're appointing to who is leading on this and how much energy and, and resources you put into any of the work that you're doing around this sends a huge message to everybody in your community about what your vision is for your school, what your values are in your school. Um, in terms of accountability, that is, we, we have used, like you said, data and using surveys to actually get clear numbers and information from our from our students which has been really really powerful just to take that to governors to our you know senior leadership team to say this is this is what your students are saying this is this is how they're feeling you know and this is what we need to do although that may seem reactionary we're seeing it as you know we're taking that step forward to hear what they're saying and we are going to act on that um and proact on that and like you said give empower our students so our aim moving forward really is to empower our students to lead on initiatives moving forward so that they can then take that forward and train other students and other um you know even teachers within the school around this topic and around the topics that come up because ultimately like you said on social media and reactions um they are they're ahead of the game <laughs> they know about a lot of what's going on so let's empower let's empower our students to to really take this beyond the school and also empower the children that are already in the school as well. Uh, yeah, fantastic points. Really, really interesting. And, and it sort of just it sort of touches now moves on to my last point about um, sort of the future of DEI um, and what are the most important topics within DEI, um, within the umbrella of DEI um, that needs sort of the most urgent attention, I suppose. Um, yeah, it'd be great to hear, hear each of your thoughts on the sort of the key um, areas of DEI that need most attention first. Um, I I came across an interesting article, and I think it was by The Guardian, but I, I'll find it, that basically asked the question of where are all the DEI coordinators now since mm -hmm. the Black Lives Matter movement and 
um, Sarah Everard, which obviously then kicked into a lot of work around misogyny. What, where are they now and what are they doing? And in that, I think the important topics are, they're, they're kind of still the same for me. When I think about the protected characteristics and the topics that most impact students, I do think about um, sexism and racism especially within an international context and the IB is beautiful when it comes to giving us those lovely learner profiles about you know being open-minded and being a strong being knowledgeable about the world around us being a global citizen and all that and I think that's great but there is a still a big problem I find with not just the private sector but international sector when it comes on to almost forgetting that they're almost in a bubble and so they forget about the, the racism that might exist um, both within and outside of their walls and the sexism. But we also forget often about ageism and what that means. So I think in short, everything's important. Um, I still would want to see an emphasis on you know, racism and sexism because those are stories we hear in the news every week. There's always a story um, and you don't have to jump across the pond from like London to America. America is a different kettle of fish, but in terms of London in my saying where I'm now, it's rampant. Um, every week there's something on it. I think last week was the comments made about the chancellor looking like someone else. So there's always something you can draw from to show the students as this is why we do what we do. And this is why this topic is still relevant. You know, a couple of years on from the Black Lives Matter movement, and then before that, there were other huge events that happened. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I've said exactly the same thing. Sorry, I think all of them, they all matter. And I think the, the umbrella of diversity is that we we need to look at all of them. And it's it's how it's how you do that and how you pull everyone along alongside with you and your strategy behind that. But I think my, my nose was like, don't stop. This is not a hashtag. This is not a trend and it's not a month. So it's something that we need to continue and feed through everything that we're doing um, and support each other with that. I think I wanted to add that this is not, it's not easy work, I think, for the people that are leading on it, for the people that are involved in it and for the people that it impacts. So it's just having that empathetic approach, having that understanding and that, that human approach to it where we're, we're, you know, we're looking at what, you know, we're, as educators, we are responsible and have the privilege of working with young people who are our future leaders. What values are we instilling in them and how are they going to take that forward? And how can we make sure that they do that in our everyday actions, our everyday interactions, not only with the students, but with each other and the wider community? I'm, those are really good points. And I, I would just want to um, focus on, on the part where in like the future of the AI. And I think it's so hard not to, not to say our hopes as people of color about when we talk about the future of the AI. And I, I agree with, with you guys 100%. I really hope for sustainability. It was such a huge relief for me to actually have this movement and and have that representation wherein we are being celebrated and I could actually see um, another people coming from the country, Philippines, which is before it's so far-fetched to, to, to take our space in the international school scene. And, and now we're here and we are we are we are actually continuing learning. But I really hope that I really love what resonated with me. It's not a hashtag. I, I always fear that it would fade away and things would go back to how things were before. So I, I really hope that the future of DEI would be sustainable. And that comes with constant reflection with our schools. Like, do we track our fa faculty diversity at, at our member schools? Do you track the pay discrepancy between... Um, all the faculties versus um, expat hires and local hires. Would you consider hiring, recruiting, uh, and the recruiting processes and looking at some of the biases and prejudices that we have there? Those are the things that I really hope the future of DEI would, would actually look into. Because from this, it's 
we, we do not hope to be divisive, but in, in return, it actually elevates the talent that that the uh, international school possess because we are getting equal opportunities to everyone, which elevates the pool of people who could contribute more to the table. And for me, that's a win-win for the school, for the administrators, for the students, and for us teachers that actually didn't have the same opportunities as before. And also, um, I really, uh, I feel like the future of BEI uh, really relies on our students. Uh, I think the the whole it's centered it's centered around the movement that they started, and we're just continuing. So we're we're all we're all in here. We're all doing this because of our students. Because we're whenever we hear them talk about these things, we're very hopeful. Okay, we're gonna be fine because <laughs> the students are leading us and they're doing the right thing. So. Um, I hope that this would continue on and I hope that we continue to have platform to share our stories and opportunities to celebrate each other and celebrate how far we've gone and acknowledging all the people that we stood on our shoulders to get us here. Fantastic. Great, great words, Jay. And um, yeah, this is just the start of the conversation. So um, yeah, very keen to, to do a part two perhaps um, and also you know continue to to sort of uh, welcome new new content articles around this topic. Um, these are such an important, huge topic. So um, yeah, looking forward to, to continue to build this productive conversation. Um, thank you all so much again for joining. And um, yeah, look forward to, to, to carrying on the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.